Good evening, everybody. Welcome in Jesus' name. We're going to get started. Um, so uh, we're, before we get started, we're going to go before the Lord in a word of prayer. So if you all please stand with us. So Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for this beautiful evening, Lord. We just thank you for this, uh, uh, giving us a country, Father, where we can worship you openly, Father, and without um, persecution. And Father, we just pray that you would um, just fill us with your spirit right now, Lord, that we would be... Um, just filled with your spirit that we would allow um, you to work in us and, and that we would give you praise as, as, we, as we sing, Father. Sing with boldness that um, even people who are passing by would see our love of the Lord. And so, Lord, we just thank you again for this time in Jesus' name.
guys can all uh, be seated if you like. Keep standing, whatever you whatever you want to do. Can we make it brighter? All I see is blue. Awesome. <laughs> I just need another perspective. <laughs>
giving my soul what to do. Father, we just we do trust in you, Lord, and in you alone, Father. There is nobody else that we put our trust in. Father, we just thank you for this time that we've had to worship you, and we just love you and praise you. Uh, why don't we all stand for the last song?
high grade each other before you sit down. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome in Jesus' name. Just want to remind you, if you haven't already done so, uh, please go ahead and silence your cell phones, mobile devices, uh, anything you may have on your person so that it won't uh, cause additional distractions while we're out here in the park. As you would imagine, there are plenty. So if we can keep our own down to a minimum, that would be greatly appreciated. And we thank you kindly in advance. Uh, just want to remind you all of a couple of announcements. Um, Family Beach Day is Friday, July 27th. That's this upcoming Friday. That's going to be all day, so you're welcome to come throughout the day. Uh, they'll be there um, fellowshipping and awaiting the uh, various arrivals of everyone coming after work, during the day, during the evening. Uh, come on out. We do ask that you bring your own food, sodas, towels, water, toys, firewood, um, so you can be comfortable and know that it's all. Um, and then if you want to bring a little extra to share, maybe that'll be a good idea too. But, uh, you know, you're on your own for all, those, all of those uh, provisions. And... Um, Again, join the group at any time, and that's at Lifeguard Tower number 23 at Bosa Chica State Beach. Next, we have LA Streets. Uh, due to scheduling conflicts, this, this ministry must take a break for the next two months. Uh, please continue to pray for this ministry, and we look forward to continuing this great outreach on September 22nd. And then the youth retreat, that's pretty much uh, two weeks away. Uh, that's going to be taking place Thursday, August 2nd through Saturday, August 4th. Uh, the cost is $75 per attendee. Please see Robin and Dolores Medina for more information and sign-ups. And last but not least, SoCal Harvest is taking place August 17th through the 19th at Anaheim Stadium. Uh, so join us, this, join the SoCal Harvest team this year. Uh, both of our pastors and uh, various leaders uh, uh, will be there all three evenings, and we encourage you to come on out and serve. Uh, if you can for a day, that would be great. If you can do it for more, that would be even awesome. Believe us, you'll be blessed. Uh, there, we, there's needs for decision follow-up workers, ushers, prayer room, set up and tear down, uh, and there's a couple others, but these are just the main ones, and uh, we'd love for you guys to come on out and, and serve and be blessed and be a part of this wonderful, wonderful evangel ev evangelical uh, outreach. So with that, go, go ahead and open up your Bibles as we're encouraging the Word by Joe. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Jesus. We're back in the shade. It's going to be hot this week. Um, open up your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 9. Psalm 9. This verse is uh, something that you should always keep to mind, keep to heart. As we're just being a Christian, you're constantly being bombarded and oppressed and looked down upon just because you love Jesus. And I really love what it says here. It says in verses 9 and 10, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. We live in a society today where we are taught from a very young age you look out for number one, right? We're in a very self-serving society. We have been taught that if we have a problem, you figure it out right you don't lean on the Lord's wisdom you just figure it out and we are quick to learn that we have to defend ourselves in all situations and we have to find basically safety in ourselves in our society today but here it says the very opposite of that it says that God is our refuge he is that place of protection that provision okay and in society and the church for a large part has forgotten to seek the Lord. Forgotten to seek his wisdom, forgotten to seek his provision, his, his, his guidance and all these things, both in times of trouble and in times of victory. A lot of times we have victory and we don't give credit to God, we take all the credit for ourselves. And so here we have to remember that he's always there for us and that shows a heart of faith in Jesus. Because if we seek the Lord, we will trust in him. And that's not all easy to do, you know, because we're always trying to solve our own problems. 
But if we put our trust in the Lord, we have peace. It says, those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. We know we can put our trust in him because he will never forsake us. And that is also stated in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So even when times get hard, my encouragement is that remember to seek the Lord because he's always there for you if you trust in him. And so with that, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we come before you. We thank you for this evening, this time in the, in the park, Lord, where we can worship you out in public. Lord, we thank you for the shade and the breeze and just the opportunity and the honor of saying and worshiping your name. So Lord, this evening as we continue, Lord, please open up our hearts to receive your word. Bless our pastor and fill him with your spirit. Help his words to just touch every single one of us, speak to every single one of us, and help us to apply those words, Lord. And Lord, for anything that is collected, tithes, gifts, or offerings, please bless them, multiply them, and use them, Lord. We thank you for this evening. We praise you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. was a bee. So we're either going to have a really exciting teaching or I don't know. Good evening. Welcome to the park. So tonight I'd encourage you to open your Bibles up to Exodus chapter 20 and we're going to be looking at the Ten Commandments going through and this is our second study through the Ten Commandments. I, I, I think it's an important study for today especially in our, our culture and in what's going on in our country and what's going on in the world. And here he says this, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Now this is an interesting idea because there are a lot of people who confuse which is the first commandment and the second commandment. Now, as we get started looking at these, I want you to realize something. You see, there are two different ways to look at the Ten Commandments. There is the Christian tradition, which says, how many of you know what the first commandment is? Anybody? According to the Christian tradition, what? Well, they start in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Because when you translate this word here, commandments, as a commandment, it makes sense to start with verse 3. It makes sense to say, well, the first commandment that I see in the text is what? You shall, and then not have any other gods before me. So the Christian tradition starts there, but if you go back and you look at the original Hebrew, the word for commandment does not mean necessarily a commandment. It means a decree or a statement. And so I want you to think about this for a minute. There in the Bible and in, in Hebrew, if you remember when Esther and when Ruth and uh, specifically Esther the king had made and had issued decrees regarding the Jews, right? The decrees weren't necessarily commands. One of the decrees was that the Jews could defend themselves and that the Jews could defend themselves against the aggression that had already been decreed against them. So a decree is not necessarily a commandment, but a statement of law, okay? It is a statement of law. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute because if you go back and you read this for what it originally said, the, the first decree is not, is not in verse 3. 
notice what it says. Go back to verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That is the first decree. And that is the Jewish tradition. According to the Jewish tradition, the first of the ten decrees starts in verse 2. And I agree with the Jewish tradition just because it follows the Hebrew better than the later Christian tradition. And so as we look at Exodus, we're going to start with the first decree in verse 2 rather than verse 3. And if you go on and look at verse 3, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above her. So if you notice, the verse 3 all the way to verse 7 is talking about what? False gods and idolatry. To me, those two things go together. Not having another god before God and not making an idol of any other god that you're not supposed to have seems to me to go together. And according to the Jewish tradition, the first decree is verse 2. The second decree is in verse 3. I'm sorry, in, ver in verse 3 to 6. And the third decree is in verse 7. And that seems to flow better with the in intent of the original Hebrew. So that's what we're going to be using as our guide as we study through the Ten Commandments. And I, I think it's really important because it flows. Now, some believe that the Ten Commandments are done and gone. They believe that the Ten Commandments were abolished by Jesus. And this, is, this couldn't be farther from the truth. I don't agree with that. The Bible is clear that these Ten Statements... These decrees for humanity, these decrees of moral standards, if you would, these decrees specifically do not just apply to the Jews. There are 613 regulations that God gives to the Jews. 613 things. Many of them are ordinances of purity that would separate them from the surrounding nations. Now, those Jesus did not... He did not reaffirm in the New Testament many of those. But the Ten Commandments he did. And even Paul did. And others. So there are Christians out there who think that the Ten Commandments do not apply anymore. But that's not true. Going through the Ten Commandments, especially when you get to verse 13 through 17, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. These are not things that apply only to Jewish people. These are not things that apply only to Christians. These are standards for humanity. It doesn't matter what country you live in. It doesn't matter what your political thoughts are. It doesn't matter what, what neighborhood you grew up in. Everybody knows it's wrong to murder. Everybody knows it's wrong to steal. Well, how do you know? How many of you feel bad when you're stolen from? No one had to teach you that. No one had to teach you that when somebody, when you were two and somebody took your sucker, that that was bad. You felt bad. You knew that, that that theft was wrong. You know that murder is wrong. You know this intrinsically. So these Ten Commandments, these Ten Decrees or statements that God gives are not just Jewish and they're not just Christian. They are the moral foundation that society has to base itself on in order to be successful and in order to be free. And this is an important thing that we need to look at. And so as we look at these, these laws were for the specific, the, the 613 laws that we talked about, those were specifically to keep Israel separate from the groups around them. So the Canaanites and the other ites that lived around Israel acted in very odd or in very pagan ways and God said I don't want you to be like them there's these ordinances that are going to keep you separate so the world looks at you differently God wanted the world to recognize Israel was different Israel was the first monotheistic religion in the world Judaism meaning that there's only one God Israel was the first time women had any rights slaves had rights animals had rights. We're going to talk about that as we go through the Ten Commandments. All of that's in here. Israel was the first place on earth where people were told 
where a an, where an objective moral standard was applied to all of humanity. So those rules were specifically to separate them from the rest. But remember what Jesus said, in Christ there is no longer Jew nor Greek, Paul said it, no longer Jew nor Greek, nor male, nor female. What that means is that there's no longer a separation between the, once we're in Christ. So those ordinances, and we talked about this a little bit this morning at service, the idea of circumcision or washing your hands in a ceremonial way or ceremonial bathing and other things of that nature, these things are no longer necessary. But those were not the 10 decrees, those were just the ordinances for Israel specifically. The Ten Commandments, however, are necessary. Now, Jesus, if you remember, he, he even as, addressed some of those ceremonial laws. Remember in Ephesians 15, or in Ephesians 2.15, Paul said, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances. Now, what he's talking about there are not the Ten Commandments, but the ordinances of Israel. D doesn't that mean that the Ten Commandments have been abolished? No. You see, Paul's talking about these ceremonial laws that keep Israel separate from the rest of the world. Now, the commands contained in those are different. And how do we know that they're different? Well, remember how Moses got the Ten Commandments. God wrote them on a tablet with his finger. The first set were written by God with the tablet on his finger, which is an interesting thing. God was saying, these are set in stone. These are universal and eternal. These don't change. The rest of them, God had Moses write on parchment, on paper. God said, Moses, go write these other ones down for everybody else. But these 10, these 10 specifically are from me to humanity in general. And this is an important thing that we need to see. You see, you see God could have abolished, if God could have abolished his moral law, his moral standard, if God could just get rid of the 10 commandments, which was God's moral standard for the world, then Jesus didn't need to die. Because if God could have just abolished the Ten Commandments and said, well, murder's not wrong anymore, and adultery's not wrong anymore, and covetousness and theft, and all of these things are not wrong anymore, idolatry, and, and all of these other things are not wrong anymore, if God could have just abolished them outright, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die because then we're not guilty anymore. But the fact of the matter is, these Ten Statements, these Ten Decrees, reveal to us the reason that we need Jesus and they give us this understanding that Jesus had to die for us because if God could have just abolished and taken away the law we would no longer be under the law therefore we're not guilty of it but you see God can't do that because the ten decrees reveal his character the ten commandments they're a law of love first of all and now they can be grouped into four group or two groups the first four being concerned with our relationship with God and the, the last six being concerned with this idea of our relationship with others and loving others so these are loving commandments these aren't evil rules that people put in place just to stick it to the peasants no now although the first commandment appears simple at your first glance I am the Lord your God the first decree that was the first thing he wanted people to know it's actually set into motion this really revolutionary, if you would, idea in human history, which is called ethical monotheism. What that means is, what that means is the belief that there's only one God and whose main wish is that we treat each other correctly. Now, God's desire was that we would live rightly, and his original plan was that we would live rightly with him. And that didn't work out. And very quickly, sin unraveled society and morality. If you remember, the first sin outside of the Garden of Eden was what? Covetousness. It wasn't murder. Cain was upset that God accepted Abel's sacrifice and did not accept his own. Cain's first sin was he coveted being accepted by God. But rather than doing the right thing to be accepted by God, remember what God told him? Cain, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what's right, beware, for sin is at the door and its desire is for you. So Cain's problem was that he coveted the relationship that Abel had with God, but refused to do what was right to obtain that relationship. And therefore, 
covetousness led to anger and anger led to murder. Because if I can't have that relationship with God, nobody will. And he killed his own brother. Very quickly, morality unraveled. And so God establishes the Ten Commandments as a way to tell society how to act towards one another so that we can be civil, so that we can have a society, so that we can do and live together. And so that this first commandment, this basis for the rest of the commandments, if you would, the statements, is important because when he says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, this is what will either make or break the other nine statements. Without this first statement, the other nine have no effect or meaning. And we'll see that in a little bit. So he says here, I am the Lord your God. Now notice I am is not all caps in your Bible. So this is not the same Hebrew word that we see back in Exodus chapter 3 when God appears to Moses in the burning bush and he says, well, who should I say sent me? I am. And that's not the same word. This is I am. So he's saying the one I, that is speaking to you, me, am the Lord. Now the word Lord there is Yahweh. That is the what's known as the Tetragrammaton. It's the, the name for God that the Jews would never speak out loud. And if they were copying the Bible, when they got to Yahweh, they would go and take a bath and change their clothes. And then they would write the word because it was so holy. And it got to be so tedious if you had like three or four in a row. Imagine. Okay, write one line out and then... Can you imagine how long homework would take parents if your kids had to go take a bath every time they came to a specific word? And change their clothes? And how much laundry you would have to do? So they started replacing Yahweh with Adonai and other names, so that way it'd be faster to copy. And they started including it, and they would just include a note. Yeah, it's a reference for this other. And so he says, I am Yahweh. Now, I am the Lord is an interesting statement. Because what he is saying here is that I am the one, the only God. Now, when you go back to God and he said, I am the I am, what that means is he's the one and the only. So when you hear of Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, it's not just the God who provides, it's the one, the only God who exists and provides. That's what that means. Well, and, and so as you go through the different names of God, and we've done this series before, you see that I am the only God, the one God who actually does stuff. And that's what he's saying. I am the Lord, your God. Now, He's saying, I am the one and only God of existence. I am the one and only God that actually lives. I am the only one and only God who provides and does all of these things for you. But I am your God. I'm not everybody's God. I'm, I'm not a universal deity that everyone can come to me from different routes. And that as long as you, know, you believe in some form of deism, then you'll finally eventually get to God because you were a spiritual person. You cannot get to God through any, every route possible. There's only one way to, to God, and that is through the Lord Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the only way, the truth, the only truth, and the life. The only life. And the only way that you're going to get to my Father in Heaven is through Calvary Chapel. That'll be $15 per person for a ticket. No! That's not how it works. You get to Heaven by going through Jesus, by accepting him as your personal Lord and Savior. And so when he says, I am your God, he is saying, I'm, I've am i separated you for myself and myself for you. Now everyone can accept him, but he's the only one. There's no one like him. Now, he, I find it interesting. God could have started out differently. And if it was me, I would have started out with, I am the Lord God who created everything. Now do what I say, right? I mean, I do that to my kids sometimes. I made you. Now obey. Or as my mom used to tell me, I brought you into this world and I can remove you from it. That was a famous saying in our house. I, can't, I can say that now because she's back in Nicaragua, so I'm okay, I'm safe. But you know, it's interesting because a lot of times when we look at what's really going on, when we look at who God is, He didn't start out with this idea of in position of imposing. He's saying, I am the Lord, your God. He starts out not with the, the dictator, the 
the dictatorial type of relationship, but I am the Lord, your God. I'm your God. I'm your personal God. We have a personal relationship. I want a personal relationship with you. It was a loving relationship, not a dictatorship. And notice how he starts this out. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So God is God. And why is it important to understand that the person giving these commandments is God? Well, as I told you before, these 10 decrees are the 10 moral standards for humanity. They're the 10 moral decrees that we need for a, a society to function, okay? How many of you agree that if everybody just murders each other, that's not going to be a society that can function. Everybody agree with that, right? How many of us understand that what's going on in Chicago and what's going on in some of these cities where there's just so many murders every single day that that society cannot function, that people can't go outside of their homes, that people can't go to work. This is just, it's not a functional society that way, right? We need a society that is stable and if we're going to have that, that means no murder. And if everybody can just steal from each other with no recourse, that's not going to function either, is it? It will fall apart. So God is saying, I am the source. Now, why is this important? Because if humans are the source of morality, and there are two, there are a number of different thoughts on this, but there are people out there who say that people have to be the, the source of a moral authority, that people have to determine what is moral and what is not. And if that's the case, then that standard is equal to humanity, and it can change as people change. And that means that what is moral here is not going to be moral over in Iran. And that's the problem that we're seeing today is that there are whole countries who think it's perfectly okay to murder their children because they didn't put on a piece of clothing. And there are entire societies who are okay with murdering their children because they didn't go to that specific church today or they didn't say their prayers to that false god. And that's not right. Now, it's important that we understand that for morals to be objective, which means that they don't change, for them to be laws, if you would, they have to be higher than mankind. They have to come from someone that is bigger than mankind, and that is the Lord. So the only way for these moral standards to function is if they came from God. If they're just a grouping of ideas that, human, that humanity has come up with on their own, well, what what is to say what is good and what is not good and this is where the world starts falling apart this idea of your truth and my truth this idea of of well it's relative to your life or relative to my life this is the problem that we have is that people do not understand that the standard for morality the standard for our society has to come from god if it doesn't it unravels and so this first this first decree that god established the the standards for society is important because it reveals to us that it is for all humankind across the globe. No one is exempt. Now, this is also an interesting idea. And, and if you're taking notes and you want to you want to make your own little outline on your paper, you can write the God of the commandment. Now, God is the one who's issuing these commandments. He is the one who is giving them to us. And so as we go through these, he's not just a God. He's not just one of them. He's our God. And he says, I am the Lord, your God, and you need to do what I say. Now, the second thing is the effect of the commandment. Now, what does he say? I'm the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, what was the land of Egypt? If you remember, the land of Egypt is where the children of Israel lived for 400 and something years. And the reason they lived there, there was a big, there was a big drought, a famine happened, and Joseph ended up in Egypt. He was sold into slavery, and Israel took all of his children down to Egypt, and they ended up being there for 430 years or so. And as they were there, towards the end, they were put into slavery. Remember that? In God's word, they were put into slavery. So here was the problem. These people were enslaved, and they're there in Egypt, and their freedom was taken away. And so what does God do? He says, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So Egypt was originally a lifeboat, if you would. And remember the, the Ark of Noah? 
Egypt many times acts like an ark for Israel. Abraham went there. Isaac went there. Israel went there. Jesus went there. Many times Egypt acts like a lifeboat. It acts as a life preserver for Israel. <coughs> God allows his children to go there for a time to keep them safe. But it turned into what? Slavery. It turned into a bad thing. It was a lifeboat, then it was home. It was home for 400 years or so. Then it became slavery, and Egypt also represents sin. So, because the slavery is like the slavery that we have in sin. It's the bondage that we have when we get addicted to sin, and when, we, when sin is just so prevalent in our lives. So he says, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of this place that was not your own, where you were just a pilgrim, where you were just somebody who was who was on your own, that was, that had no place of your own, and then I brought you out of the house of bondage. So not only a place that wasn't your own, but out of slavery. Now, in the Old Testament, there's two kinds of slavery in the Bible. The first kind is forced slavery, and that's what we know as bondage. This idea of bondage is the same idea that when, and by the way, it wasn't started by the United States, but we did participate in it, this idea of going to Africa and taking slaves, and, and enslaving people in Africa, and taking them throughout the world so that they would be in text. Meaning, in English we have one word for love, but in, in Greek they have four words for love. And in English we have multiple words for slavery or bondage or indentured servitude or whatever. In, in Hebrew they have one. It's just the one word for both indentured servitude and slavery. But the second one is indentured servitude. It's a voluntary slavery. Pastor, voluntary slavery. Who in their right mind would subject themselves voluntarily to slavery? Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you have a credit card? Okay, so there's your answer. When you subject yourself to economic slavery, right? You borrow money promising to pay it back. I will work for you until I pay you back every cent. That is indentured servitude. In effect, you're saying, you're selling yourself in the future for money now. That's what a credit card does, right? You're saying, I will work to pay this back in the future. There are other ways, and I don't like them at all, but it's interesting, there, even today, reverse mortgages are another one. I, I want you to give me money now, and then you're gonna take property from me later. Or there are people in many countries across the world who go to a person, also known as a coyote, and says, take me across the border to the United States and I will work for you for five years or seven years or 10 years or however much it is because they don't have enough money to pay this guy cash to get them into the country. So they offer him their lives as payment. I will work for you for so many years until I pay off the debt. Sadly. This is where a lot of, of, of human trafficking starts. This is where a lot of, of drug mules get inducted into their services because they don't realize that the kind of work that these evil people want them to do are wrong things. There are some who will come and they'll work in a sweatshop or they'll work in a field for 10 years before they can pay off their debt and actually be free to go off and do whatever they want. That's voluntary indentured servitude. You're saying, I cannot pay this back, I cannot take care of this, therefore I will sell myself to you to pay off the debt. Now in the Bible we see this many times, where if someone had a debt that they couldn't pay, they could either be thrown in prison until they paid the debt, or they could be they could say to the say you had a landowner that you borrowed money from, look, I'll work in your vineyard for three years until I pay you back the money. Now the neat thing about this kind of servitude is that if at the end of three years you really like your job you got married to one of the other servants there and you and they had kids and, and you had kids and you, you just wanted to stay you didn't want to leave you like your job this person treats you well you could become his permanent servant his bond servant and they would take you to the doorpost of the house they'd pierce your ear and put his signet in your ear and you now work for him permanently it became a permanent arrangement and so there were people who would do that. They wanted to. And so when you hear Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, it's someone 
who had offered his life as a bond servant, who willingly became a slave for Christ because he loved the way that Christ treated him. So there's two types of slavery there. But Israel were not just in Egypt working off a debt. They were, they were in bondage. They were in forced labor, unable to leave again. Uh, and and this was all against their will. Now I want you to think about that. They were slaves, which means they they were not free. Now God wanted people to be free. This is something that's way different than every other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world enslaves enslaves those who believe in, in their God. If you look at all of these other religions, it's all about what you have to do for them, what you do for that God, what how that God needs your help. Now, to be clear, in Christ, we have a relationship with Christ and we, we serve Him, we worship Him, we give Him our lives because we want to, not because we're forced to. I'll give you the example of Islam. In Islam, they forcefully try to convert people to their religion and if they don't convert, what do they do? They murder them. That is the basis of the Quran. It's not I'm not I'm not talking about just a group of Islamic people, not just Islamic militants. The Quran states that if you believe in Allah, their God, that if someone refuses to accept Allah, then you are to murder them and that's also known as jihad. Okay, this isn't just a, a small portion of people. Now, to be fair, there have been groups of Christians throughout the years. I mean, the Crusades, right? And and the I mean, the Crusades are probably the biggest one. But then you have the, the Inquisition and others, where when people did not convert. But that wasn't everybody. That wasn't dictated by God. That was just dictated by some evil rulers. But in the Quran, it says very specifically, no, everyone has to die. God does not want to enslave people. See, when you go back to Genesis, the Bible says that God created Adam and Eve, and, and there was always this question I used to have in my head. Why in the world did God put a tree there that they couldn't eat? How messed up is that? Why, God, did you give us a choice? Wouldn't it have been better if there wasn't a tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Wouldn't it have been better if mankind didn't need to choose? It was just going to work right the whole time. But you see, here's the thing. God wants you to choose Him freely. God wants you to choose Him freely. Now, as Christians, we understand that. But let me just have you understand this. God wants society to be free. God hates slavery. God hates slavery to sin. God hates slavery of mankind. God hates slaves of the devil. God wants you to be free and he wants you to use that freedom to choose a relationship with him. This is one of the foundational principles of Christendom, that you are free so that you can choose Christ. And in the end, there is only one choice that's gonna ever matter in the universe and that is the choice that you make to receive Christ or not if you choose Christ then everything else will fall in line and if you don't choose Christ nothing else will fall in line but the issue is this if you do not choose Christ then eternity will be different for you than those who do choose Christ because when you choose Christ hell is off the table and God is giving you the free choice to do that. So God said, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of bondage so that I could be your God, so that we could have a relationship, so that you could choose me. Which is why the worst sin in the Bible was not David cheating on his wife or murdering Uriah or any of these other things, but when Saul refused to recognize God. It's when Israel rejected God and went after idols. It's when Israel did not worship God and they did not choose Him for themselves. When they used their freedom to walk away from God, that's the worst thing that you can do on the planet. God wants you to be free, but He does that so that you can freely choose Him. So here, God hates slavery. He created us to be free. He gave us free will. He gave us free reign. He gave us a great relationship with Him, but we need to choose Him. Now, freedom is this is a funny thing, and I want you to think about what I'm about to say because it might get a little confusing. Freedom doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want. I thought you said it was freedom. 
let me ask you a question. Is it freedom to say everyone can murder? Is it freedom to say everyone can murder? No. Because if everyone is free to murder, steal, covet, commit adultery, to reject God and do all of these other evil things, you don't have freedom, you have anarchy. We don't call that freedom, we call that anarchy. Freedom can only work in a moral society. Within the confines of a free society, you have to have a moral standard that everyone is free to follow. And what that means is, do whatever you want as long as it fits within this moral standard. So, yes, you can have your own business, but you can't steal, you can't covet. Yes, you can have a relationship, but you can't commit adultery and you can't destroy the family unit. Yes, you can have a skirmish and defend yourself, but you cannot murder and you cannot take unnecessary life without a reason, without justification. Yes, you can do this or that, but there are rules, there are standards, and that's called the moral standard that God himself has given us that we can be free. So freedom does not mean that you can do whatever you want. If everyone, imagine a world where everyone did as they pleased. Everyone drove as they pleased with no speed limits and no regulations on the roads at all. What if they just abolished the whole DMV and the police force and the army and no laws existed anymore no moral standards you could do whatever you wanted well if they did that they would take what they want kill who they want they would say what they want they would steal what they want they would lie about what they want that's not a free society is it because you would no longer be free to pursue that which you wanted to do because you'd always be afraid of somebody taking your life the freedoms of some will encroach on the rights of others if you don't have a moral standard. So what is God doing in the first decree? He's saying, I am God. I am the one who's going to give you these other nine. I am going to give you a moral standard that will allow you to be free. It wasn't just to direct them back to God, but it was to set up a standard for, of morality for society, not just Jews, but for society in general, that the people could be free. So all society has to be based on a system of morals and ethics which limit what you do so that people can be free. Now, if that's true, that means we need an uncorruptible source for our, our or a moral authority that is not human because humans are foul and we are sinful. So we need an uncorruptible source of moral authority. We need a moral authority that is better than us. Hence we go back, I am the Lord you, your God. God gave us these 10 statements that we would know how to operate society. Finally, I want you to realize this. There is an obligation that goes with this commandment. God says, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of bondage. If God has given us freedom, if God has brought us out, it wasn't a human being who did this. It wasn't Moses who parted the Red Sea or who brought manna from heaven or who provided quail from heaven or who, who spoke to the rock or struck the rock and provided water for them. It wasn't Moses who created the fire nato and the... And the and the, the smoke tornado. It wasn't Moses who did any of those things. It was God who brought them out of Egypt. It was God who orchestrated the entire thing. It was God who did this thing. These are all from the Lord himself that we might know that he is God. Now, he did this first so we would trust his word, that we would trust these decrees. We would know, okay, we gotta trust this guy. He brought us out. So because it is God who saves us, we are obliged to him and him only. If God has set us free, then we are obligated to serve him in the way that he demands. And that is the same for Christ. If you are free in Christ because you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you are obligated to serve him. You are obligated to follow him. You are obligated to worship him. And this is a key issue for all of us because 
what the obligation is to live according to the things that God has called us to. Now, for the Jews, it was the Ten Commandments. For all of us, it's what Christ has said. Without these commandments, we cannot have a civil society. We cannot have a moral Christianity or an ethical lifestyle. You can't. And as you have, as we learn to focus on God, who is the one who established this moral code of conduct, then you're going to see the society works. Now, something you can do as you're watching the news later, think about this. Society started by removing God as the foundation and moral authority of society. What happened next? Everything else has unraveled in the past 60 years, right? They removed God, and now that they've removed God, everyone is killing whoever they please. They're, they're being sexual with whomever they please. They're stealing whatever they please. And I'm not just talking about <coughs> theft internally. We'll talk about that later. But they're covetous over everyone else's things. You see this in the news. Anytime you see somebody talking about the 1% versus the 99%, I really don't care if Jeff Bezos has $150 billion as long as my bills are paid. If my bills are paid, I don't care how much he has. How many of you have Amazon? How many of you have Amazon? How many of you appreciate next day delivery? Isn't it amazing? I appreciate that somebody came up with the product and the service that I like and he can have as much money as he wants. As long as I am not getting ripped off, I'm okay. Bill Gates made lots of money on Microsoft. I appreciate that there is one platform that we all know, Microsoft Word, right? That everyone can use. It's universal before, I, I, maybe you don't remember. I certainly remember the 300 platforms that we had before Word. And no, none, of, none of them worked together. And you couldn't take a file from a Mac and put it on a Linux computer or on an IBM computer. It just, it was terrible. I don't care how much money Bill Gates has. But if you look at what's going on in the world and you see the covetousness of people saying, well, they have more than I do and that's not fair. How is that not fair? See, it's not that it's not fair. It's that you didn't work for it. And so you're covetous over what somebody else has rather than going out, getting a job and getting your own money. We have seen over and over again, and we're going to see this as we go through the Ten Commandments, how a society that does not accept God as their moral authority, their source of moral authority, a society that doesn't follow these ten decrees as the foundation of their morality cannot stand. So I want to encourage you to do two things. As you learn these, teach these to your children. Look at them for yourself and say, you know, if everyone accepted God as a source of moral authority, then there'd be a lot less problems in this world. If everybody followed these 10 rules, these 10 decrees, there would be a lot less problems in the world. And I want you to see what areas in your life you need to start changing so that you can align your heart with these 10 decrees. And the first one is, is God the authority over your heart? Is he the moral authority that you follow? Not what the world says or what the masses say or what was voted on democratically or any of these other things, but what but God himself, that him and his word is what guides your heart and declares what you will and will not do. And I want to encourage you with that. I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of slavery from Egypt. Now it's time that we serve him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we thank you that you've given us just, you've given us so much. And for society, Lord, you have given us your word and you have given us the ability to know who you are. And we pray that today as we come before you that, Lord, you would help us to recognize you as our moral authority. Lord, that we would follow you in our society and that we would proclaim you as our God. So we thank you for who you are and what you're doing. We thank you, Father, for the wonderful the wonderful things that you've given us. And we pray that today as we, as we end the service here in the park, Lord, we just thank you that we can worship you in public. I pray that you give us boldness, not just to show up in the park for our services on Sunday nights, but, Lord, to share with others and to share with our co-workers and our friends and our families that all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and go before the Lord to the final song.
God bless you guys. Have a great, great evening.